Thank you for that lovely introduction. And I have to say, quite a few of you have been through training with us. So you know that we refer to GSPI and Silent Spring Institute among the very few who are able to walk that line credibly between sci being solid on the science and still being able to make change and have headlines and write press releases like this. So it's very impressive. Slightly different from what Rebecca was talking about, SCN comes in when you have a research paper ready to publish. Um, we work with scientists who are gonna share their research through the media. And what I'll talk about today is based on what we've seen over 20 years of working with environmental health researchers and journalists. But when you have a paper that's getting ready to publish, and I invite you all to work with us on those, we do a much more in-depth one-on-one training as well. So today we're gonna to talk about what reporters need in order to tell people about your work. We'll talk about messages, why you need them, how you get them, how you use them. And I wanna talk a bit about communicating uncertainty that's inherent in good science. So how does research become a news story? Basically building on Rebecca's presentation, you can help reporters by telling them why your study is important to their audience. So when you're not doing a press release, but instead you're doing interviews about your research, tell the reporter what you found in very plain language because reporters are smart, but they're not often scientists. You wanna tell them why what you found matters to their audience. So you need to know who their audience is and you wanna tell them what's new about it because as Rebecca said, news is by definition, new information. What's interesting? These are gonna end up being your main messages. And while it seems simple, it's really not. It takes hard work to distill your research, all of it into clear, concise, easy to understand main messages. So that's what we're gonna talk about. But first, I'd like you to know a little bit about reporters. Okay? Who are news reporters and what do they need from scientists? Reporters are generally overworked. They are well-educated, highly trained, skilled professionals. They're really good at gathering and presenting information. They're not usually experts in your field, although a few are, but most aren't. They're typically smart. They're under pressure. They might be covering several beats at once and they're on deadline and deadlines aren't flexible. So if a reporter tells you, this is my deadline, that's it. They wanna tell a good story. They care deeply about being interesting to their audiences. They need controversy and balance to make a good story. And they'll usually try to show at least two sides of something. Know in advance that a reporter is very likely to take your study to someone who may be critical of the study and ask them what they think about it. All of this during the embargo period. And they'll do that to get the balance. Um, listen for that, read for it, and see if, it, if you start to see that in your reading of articles. Reporters try to give the facts with as little bias as possible. They really want to get it right. They don't take it lightly if someone gives them wrong information just to get a good headline. A reporter might be your friend outside of work, but when they're working on a story, you are just another source. Anything you say may be used, it can end up in the story. And reporters have word limits. They have editors who edit their work to make a story that will sell. So it's not even just the news, it's about selling. I mean, news after all is a product like toothpaste, um, has to attract advertisers and sell newspapers, that kind of thing. So now you know a bit about reporters and what they need from you. So here are some basic differences between scientist and journalist cultures. And I apologize in advance for generalizations, um, but this is, gonna help you figure out, sort of understand how reporters are approaching reporting on your science. And I wanna thank Nancy Barron on whose book, this is very loosely based. <laughs> Scientists take their time, sometimes a lot of time to be as specific as possible while journalists work fast using the best information available before their deadline hits. Scientists are specific about what they know while journalists ask questions and try to convey the main idea. You know, when you read an article, the headline and the first paragraph are the main idea of all the details follow. Scientists talk about what they found while journalists want to know why does that matter to my audience? This is a biggie. Science doesn't pr prove anything. It, it disproves. While the news media has to report facts, they have to report what is certain. However, they can correct the record later. 
And scientists live in a nuanced world, caveats, details. Reporters have word limits and try to talk about the big picture. So here is some exa here's an example of how this, these cultural differences play out. This is the title of a study sent to reporters. And here's what reporters did with that. These were the headlines they came up with. Um, reporters are going to appreciate it if you can help them boil down your findings into plain language that give the main idea and why it matters. And you only have so much control. You can't tell the reporter what to write, but you can make it easy for them to understand what your main messages are and what you want them to know. And remember, sometimes editors write the headlines and they do that to sell papers or attract advertisers. So here's a cartoon that you may be familiar to all of us. So how do you tell reporters about your research so they, can, so they can report it accurately, so they can understand what's most important about your research when they're not experts in your field? You invert the pyramid. You want to have the main points in the top of the pyramid, because um, this is how reporters, a lot of reporters use this image to tell their, um, tell their stories. Most important stuff in the top, details follow. Often reporters will tell the whole story in the headline and the first paragraph because people don't often read past that if it's not something they're super interested in. So if you want to get the main points, that's what you do. And same for um, radio, for example, you're either hooked early or you're not. This is almost the opposite of science writing. So you're going to talk to reporters and you know what they need, but an interview is friendly and it can be conversational, but it really isn't a chat. You have an agenda. You want to go into an interview with an absolutely clear idea of what you want to tell the reporter, and you want to be prepared to say it clearly and concisely in several different ways during an interview because people remember things best when they hear them about six times in slightly different ways. And I know that's resonating with people who've been through this training because I say that a lot. Um, this is a picture of a shrimp on a tiny treadmill. And I'm just going to tell you a quick story because this is an example of how you can miss a great media opportunity if you're not prepared with solid messages. An excellent climate researcher had as a byproduct of his research this adorable clip of a shrimp running on a tiny treadmill. His grad student posted it on YouTube. It went viral. It was really cute, and it ended up in front of the Today Show producers. They invited the researcher on the show, said, bring the, you know, the clip of the shrimp on a treadmill. The scientist said, this was great. Everyone's going to hear about my research. But he showed up, and the hosts asked good questions. You know, why did you do this? What does it mean? But he, the researcher wasn't prepared with quick, clear, concise messages. So the, the hosts just jumped off into, well, do shrimp like running on a treadmill? Do they ever sprain their ankles? Do they have ankles? Do they sweat? And it got, became a very cute piece, but unfortunately, the scientist unintentionally missed a great opportunity because he wasn't prepared with clear, concise messages. So to make sure this never happens to you, we're gonna talk about messages, what you found, and why it matters. You need clear messages before you start talking to reporters. If you know what you wanna say before you start interviewing, you're gonna have a lot more control during the interview. And in fact, you can often use your main messages to answer even the toughest questions. One way people organize their thoughts, um, they write the two or three most important points, you know, what they found and why it matters on a file card in front of them and keep it there for interviews or memorize it. These are your main messages, right? So if you remember that inverted pyramid, these are the points you wanna see in the headline in the first paragraph. And if more than two or three people are gonna be, um, or if you're working with an entire group of people, say several people will be doing interviews, Everyone should have the same two or three main points and then their own areas of expertise underneath. And you only want two or three main messages because more than that, you will confuse the reporter. They won't know where you're pointing them to the right and to what's your main point. Messages should be in plain language, short sentences, no jargon, and practice on friends who aren't involved in your field and see if they understand what you're talking about really easily. Then you know you've got it. Uh, once you have your main messages, repeat them several times throughout the interview because that's how people will remember them best. It's how you steer the reporter to what's most important. So the bottom line is if reporters don't have to guess what your study's about or what's most important about it, they're much more likely to report it accurately. 
And it's a huge bonus if you can help them by pointing them to what you found and why that matters to their particular audience. So here's a message as it came from the researchers. Nothing wrong with it, it's true. But here it is boiled down for reporters. And it's not dumbed down at all. This is boiled down so a reporter can understand more readily what you're talking about. So that's what you wanna do with your messages. For presenting scientific research, you're, you're, you're there to talk about your science. You're not trying to persuade anyone, convince anyone, or spin any facts. So your messages are almost always going to be what you found and why it's important. Um, it's not usually gonna be why you did this research, what question you answered, how you designed your study, where the funding came from. It's not gonna be thanking your university. All of that can come later but this is what's gonna pull the reporter in and make them interested in, your, in covering your study. So enough on messages, I'm gonna switch gears here and talk about communicating uncertainty because uncertainty in science, it's tricky. Reporters need to report facts, things that are certain and good science doesn't usually provide that type of certainty. This quote from Andy Revkin, who was the New York Times science reporter for a long time, um, sums it up beautifully. So how do you talk about uncertainty in science and still give the reporter something certain to report? Okay, we've thought about this a lot. Um, this works for many people. <laughs> you confirm certainty where you know it and you acknowledge uncertainty where it exists. Don't hide from it. For example, if your messages are based on research done on animals and a reporter says, but what does this mean for people? You can say, we've certainly seen enough evidence in the lab to know we should be concerned or we should investigate further or whatever you wanna say but we don't know for absolute certain at what level this causes health harm because we haven't tested it on humans. Um, I have some examples of all of these coming up, but the phrase, we know enough to know that is really powerful with reporters. They can take that and run with it. You're giving them something certain, even though you're not saying you're hundred percent guaranteeing anything. You can flip the burden of proof. The reporter says, so you're not sure early life exposure to phthalates causes health harm. You can say, I am certain the safety hasn't yet been proved and I'm certain there's enough evidence that we should look further or be concerned. If your work is gonna be controversial, if you think you're worried about that, it helps to have several experts lined up as third party validators. These are people who are expert in the field who've agreed to read your paper and told you they'll be generally available to talk to a reporter or two who wants another perspective. Um, some reporters won't use someone recommended by the author, but some are great, very grateful to have that ready. You can also have a list of um, very recent peer-reviewed papers that support your findings. Those things help. Um, be familiar with other points of view that reporters are gonna hear and be prepared to inoculate them to comments critical of your study because you know they're gonna show your study to someone else and try and get someone to criticize it to make that kind of balance. You can check out American Council on Science and Health's website or junkscience.com to see what kinds of things you might be prepared to respond to. Although most people know the limitations of their study and are ready to address those. Here's an example, um, wonderful example of an attorney with Earth Justice who tells the reporter confirming uncertainty and then she also says what she's sure of. Very strong language. I don't know that it will do this but we have seen it cause harm and enough, absolutely required. Those are really strong words. So she says what she knows and what she doesn't. This is a great example in The Guardian, two completely different headlines the same day about the same study. I didn't work on this, but my guess is that the journalist talked to the researcher and wrote the story. And later that day, someone critical of the study provided another point of view, uh, which made the reporter have to go back and change the story. This is why it's good to tell the reporter in advance if there are other points of view that are likely to change the story. Tell them what they're gonna hear when they talk to people critical of the study and give them your responses first so they won't be so easily pulled off track. This is a biggie. It's, it's really up to the scientists to make sure the reporter understands the difference between cause, causation and association. Um, my dog is making noise behind me. I hope you didn't hear that. It's easy for a reporter to write that A causes B, but you know science doesn't usually provide that kind of certainty. So 
it's more nuanced to understand the significance of A is associated with B, which may be second nature to you, but it's not to everybody. You may need to educate the reporter or a community group you're speaking with on the relevance of association for human exposures. Be very clear about whether you found an association or whether your finding is causal, a really big difference, and it's one reporters don't always understand readily. If you don't wanna cause alarm and you're concerned about your work being taken seriously and being reported accurately, the word cause should be a red flag for you as in this exposure caused that effect. If you hear yourself using it or you hear the reporter parodying it back to you, make sure it's the right word. Make sure it's what you really mean and if not, correct them. And be clear about your findings. These are great headlines, right? They're attention getting, but the problem is the research was done in mice, not children. So the headlines were misleading, implying the study was on kids and implying the findings you know, caused these effects in kids. Failing to make sure the reporter knows the details and the limitations of a study and understands the difference between association and causation can damage your credibility with reporters the next time they won't come to you to hear about your study. So keep in mind with these headlines that the scientists may have done a great job conveying the reporter. The articles might be fantastic and accurate, and it's possible the reporter and um, the editor tweaked the headlines. It does happen. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does. So we don't want to ever point blame because things happen. We really hope to work with all of you in the future. So please keep us posted on your new research as it's working its way toward publication. We do our best work with a few weeks advance notice because as Rebecca said, if a paper's already online, it's not really new news. Um, please come to us early if you'd like our help and think about your main messages. You can send them to us or your press office with your not yet published paper. We're not scientists, so practice those plain language explanations on us. And if we get it, we can be pretty sure reporters will too. And the sooner you tell the journal you want to do media work on your paper, the better. They generally need advance notice to control their own publication schedules. And that's ready for questions.